we're starting chapter two, which is called basic chemistry. So remember when we talked last chapter about characteristics of living things, and we talked about them being organized, we talked about how they were organized into levels. And our first level was the chemical level. So in order to understand life, which remember is our topic for the year, we, we want to start on the chemical level and have an understanding of how atoms and molecules and reactions work so that we can understand how cells are put together and how cells function to keep us alive. So our chemical level is our first level of organization. Remember that matter is everything that's around us. And let's talk about some examples. So in class, we talked about how the table was solid matter, how ice is solid matter, papers were solid matter. And liquids would include things like alcohol or acetone or water. And then gases would include things like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we also talked about how you can't necessarily see all matter because gases, for example, are so spread out and the molecules and atoms are so tiny, we can't actually see them with our naked eye. And so our general working definition of matter is that it's anything that takes up space and has mass. All right, so let's talk about atoms. So matter we know is made out of atoms. Atom actually comes from Democritus 2,500 years ago. It means unable to be cut. Now, technically, we know today that you can have something smaller than an atom. You can have a subatomic particle, but atoms are the smallest units of matter. Why do I say that? Because if I was to take just a proton, which I'm sure you know is one of the particles that's in an atom, it wouldn't matter whether I took that proton from carbon or oxygen or hydrogen, all protons would be identical. So the smallest unique piece of matter is an atom. Once you get smaller than that, protons are all the same. Neutrons are all the same. It's only carbon if it has a specific combination of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And if it has a different combination of those things, it's hydrogen or oxygen, or one of the other elements. So our subatomic particles, I'm sure you've learned these in middle school, are our proton, our neutron, and our electron. Also, these have mass, but it's so, so, so tiny that we typically don't measure the mass of a single proton, neutron, or electron in grams. Chemists have come up with a special unit called AMU, or atomic mass units, and that's how we measure the mass of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So running through really quick, protons weigh one AMU, neutrons weigh one AMU, and electrons weigh zero AMUs. Now technically, let's talk about this very quickly, we know that electrons do have mass, but their mass is so, so, so tiny and insignificant that for purposes of AMU, we're gonna say that it's zero AMU. But don't think that they don't have any mass. We're really just kind of rounding, so to speak. All right, where do we find protons, neutrons, and electrons? Well, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom, which is in the center. And then electrons are in an outer area that we generally call the cloud. And a lot of this you'll learn in much more detail if you take chemistry. The charge on a proton is a plus one. The charge on a neutron is zero, think neutral, neutrons are neutral, and the charge on electrons is a minus one. So protons are positive, electrons are negative. And then why are each of these things important? Well, protons will determine what element it is. For example, if it has six protons, it's carbon. If it has one proton, it's hydrogen. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. So that's what really makes an element is the number of protons. Neutrons, which is the number of, um, which is also in the nucleus, this will tell us what isotope it is, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, but you can have the same element, for example, carbon, can have different numbers of neutrons. There's a carbon that's a carbon-14, there's a carbon that's a carbon-12, and there's another carbon that's a carbon-13. They all have six protons, you kind of write the protons at the bottom, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So the neutrons can be changed, and those are called isotopes, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then electrons tell us how it will react with other atoms. 
because atoms like to have a certain number of electrons in their outermost shell, because their electrons are sort of arranged in levels or shells. And if they don't have a full outer shell, they tend to want to react with other atoms. So the number of electrons will sort of tell us how that atom will react with others. Will it want to steal electrons from other atoms? Will it want to give its electrons away? Uh, or will it stay neutral because it's, it's happy with the number of electrons that it currently has? And we call atoms that have charges, because they've either picked up or, or given away their electrons, we call those ions. And we're going to get to some of these vocabulary words in a couple of minutes. But that kind of gives you an introduction. So elements, let's talk about the elements. So an element is a single type of atom. And each element has specifically a unique number of protons. And I mentioned this a moment ago, that if you change the number of protons, it's a different element. So this is the most important subatomic particle for determining what element something is would be the number of protons. Now, the number of protons is also called the atomic number of that atom. So, for example, carbon has six protons, which means its atomic number is also six. And on the periodic table, which I'll show you in a moment, they usually have that number above it. So you see their atomic number, and it's the number of protons. Notice it also comments that it's the number of electrons, but we'll get to that in a moment. We represent the elements with symbols. Some of them are really easy to remember. Most people know, for example, carbon is, is C and hydrogen is H. Some of them, though, come from Latin words, so the symbols are not as obvious to us. Like Na stands for natrium, which is basically sodium. Uh, another one that you may have heard is potassium is K. Um, gold is Au. Uh, mercury is Hg. So some of our elements, the symbols don't seem to match, but it's because they're coming from the original Latin uh, words for those elements. That's where they're coming up with those symbols. And then below the atom is what's called the atomic mass. So see how this is 12.01? This is the average mass of all the different isotopes in nature. And I mentioned isotopes on the previous slide, but we're going to come uh, up on the next slide or two and give a more detailed definition of isotopes. So here's a picture of the periodic table. Notice that the periodic table organizes all the atoms in order of their atomic number or their number of protons. So hydrogen has one proton. It's first. Then helium is second. Then lithium. So notice three, four, five, six, seven. So they are organized in the table in order of the number of protons or that's also called, remember, their atomic number. So from a periodic table, you can answer some simple questions, hopefully. How many protons does calcium have? So we find calcium. The number above 20 is the number of protons. What is the atomic number of oxygen? Well, remember, the atomic number is the same thing as the number of protons. So if we find oxygen up here, its atomic number would be Eight, because it has eight protons. And finally, what is the atomic mass of sodium? So remember, the atomic mass is that decimal number underneath. So if we find sodium over here on the left, its atomic mass is 22.99. And oh, and technically that would be AMU, by the way. All right, so again, why are we talking about this? because we're made out of these atoms, and they have all kinds of very important jobs in our body. Mostly, we can actually limit the things we're made of to four main elements, and you can remember it by remembering CHON. It's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Those are actually the four most common atoms, if you look, in our bodies. And that's because they compose things like water, proteins, our DNA, fats that we all have, carbohydrates like sugars, all of those things are made out of those four elements. The other elements we still need, but we don't need as much. And then there are some elements that we need in teeny, 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 tiny amounts. See how they've accounted for those down here, less than 0.01%. Those are called trace elements. And an example of one that your textbook gives is iodine. So you only need about 650 
micrograms of iodine a day. Remember, a microgram, that weird little symbol, that's a millionth of a gram. So we're talking like the millionth of the weight of a paper clip. That's the amount of iodine you need per day. Teeny, 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 tiny amount. But yet, if you don't get it, you can suffer from uh, thyroid problems. And your thyroid regulates your metabolism. So you can end up with hypothyroidism, or you can end up with a goiter, or some other kind of problem. So trace elements, even though you only need tiny amounts, they're still important. All right, isotopes. So we've thrown this word out a few times. Let's talk about isotopes. So although all elements have the same number of protons, um, what I mean by that, all atoms of a particular element, in other words, if it's carbon, it's always going to have the same number of protons as every other carbon. You find any carbon atom anywhere in the universe, it will always have six protons. But the number of neutrons can vary. And so most elements have at least two different forms. And those are called isotopes, and they have different numbers of neutrons. Now, why do we care about isotopes? Well, uh, there's a couple of reasons. It's specifically in, in medicine, I'll show you some important uses for isotopes, but also in, uh, in fossil dating and some things like that. Um, so we call that number of protons plus neutrons the mass number. So, and then... The average of all the isotopes in nature is called the atomic mass. So these sound very similar to each other, but they're actually a little bit different. So for example, carbon-12 has six protons and it has six neutrons. Its mass number is 12 because that's the number of protons and neutrons. Carbon-13 still has six protons, but it has seven neutrons. And so its mass number is 13. And carbon-14 has six protons, because it's still carbon, but it has eight neutrons, and so its mass number is 14. Now, if we were to look at all the carbon that exists in nature and add up all the carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, and account for how common each one is, and get an average of how much an average weight of carbon would be, that's where we get the atomic mass of 12.011. It's an average of all the carbon-12, carbon-13, and 14. And it turns out that in nature, uh, almost all the carbon that exists is carbon-12, and that's why it's 12.011. Chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine-37, and chlorine-35. They both have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. The atomic mass, the decimal number for chlorine, is 35.45. Notice it's a decimal, and it's in between. Now you might say, oh, but it's a lot closer to 35. Well, that's because there's a lot more of this chlorine in nature than chlorine-37. If they were equally found in nature, then the mass, the atomic mass, would be more like 36, right in between. But it takes into account how common they are. And since this one is more common, the average ends up closer to that. Sort of like how your test scores are weighted differently than your homework scores in my class. You don't just add up your grade on the test, your grade in the homework, and the grade on the lab and divide by three to get your average in my class. Homeworks count, I don't know, 15%, but tests count 60%. And so because they count different amounts, the average is weighted. Same concept here. Okay, and so to wrap this up, uh, we did a little practice in class, and I'm not going to fill out this whole table, but you can actually get everything on this table from the information that's given. So here, we know that protons are 14. Silicon 28, they're telling you the mass number is 28. Well, since the protons plus the neutrons make the mass number, 28 minus 14 protons tells me it would be 14 neutrons. Now, they're not always the same number. And then for the electrons, as long as it doesn't have a charge, in nature, all atoms are neutral. Remember, protons are positive and electrons are negative. So in order for it to be neutral, to cancel, the number of electrons and protons would have to be equal. All right, we'll do one more real quick. Nitrogen, 14, so the mass number is 14. It has seven electrons. That would mean it has seven protons. 
and then 14 minus 7, it also has 7 neutrons.